Now, ladies and gentlemen, we'll have Ms. Kate Mavuti, who's the head of Strathmore University's extractive sector. Uh, just a point of, of correction, if I may. Uh, I am Kate Mavuti, former director of the Strathmore Extractives Industry Center, um, housed at the Strathmore Law School in Nairobi, Kenya. Um, there has been a change of guard, so there, there is a new, new leadership, very capable leadership, and we look forward all working together to really engage with the, the likes of this distinguished panel. So I'm very honored to even be um, a, a part of the, the panel. The area of my presentation ideally is twofold. One, the future of fossil fuels in light of our new reality of COVID-19, and two, our African governments um, prepared already for this said future. Now, I'm sure that a lot of the things that I will say today are repetitions and they're not new. Um, a lot of the a lot of the the um, points that I will make today are not new, and I think I'll be echoing what a lot of the participants have already said. But just as a point of just to state some realities, to really state um, set the stages that one we've all know that fossil fuels play an extremely important role in driving many African economies. Two, that the uh, continent, as has um, been pointed out by uh, Prof. Damilola, is abundant in natural resources, whether it's fossil fuels, oil, gas, and minerals, or coal, or other renewables like solar, wind, and hydro. Um, so just as, a, as there are many numerous benefits and opportunities stemming from cultivating fossil fuels energy, there are similarly numerous challenges in doing so. That said, the major argument um, that has been made in favor of the shift to clean energy uh, is ideally the need to reduce carbon emissions into the environment. And as an oil and gas lawyer, we have to really consider and, and, and balance this vis-a-vis -vis the current needs, the current energy needs, and the realities of the African continent's several capacity and ability to absorb and produce a lot of this energy. Um, so therefore, uh, the key thing to really consider is, is, is taking a lot of these um, conversations that we're having with that very carefully and um, putting in, in light of the matter that that numerous considerations that go into whether or not governments are prepared as one of the questions proposes. Um, you're looking at economic factors, you're looking at political will and political factors, you're looking at capacity um, and the like. So um, I've just put in very quickly that one of the three important factors, and this I guess is a repetition to consider when discussing the future of fossil fuels is one, that there is a large demand of energy for energy in Africa whatever um, kind of energy there is that large demand to, um, what is really the ability to sustainably, both economically and environmentally, produce the required energy? And I'll put there reliably. I think we'll visit the issue of reliability of supply of energy um, at the very end of my presentation. And then three, what is the ability to effectively and sustainably utilize, basically, um, capacity for efficient utility of, of um, energy, if we're talking about uh, renewable energy or green energy on the like, how is the most effective way for um, that energy to be used without uh, going through certain pitfalls such as waste of energy, for instance, waste of, of, of um, uh, funding, for instance, and, and uh, the like. Now, putting it into context of our current reality of the corona pandemic, um, we've seen that it has brought about uh, decline in a lot of economic activities globally, with industries either shutting down or significantly reduced in operations. For instance, the aviation industry, the manufacturing industry. I think um, uh, Mr. Kastande also mentioned um, uh, a decline in, for example, transport and even revenue collection for government. So, um, just to add on that, we were all amazed and we all saw the recent collapse in the oil prices recently due to a flurry of different reasons, but majorly as a consequence of the reduced um, demand for, and I'll just put in oil since I'm, I'm more averse to oil, but yeah, for reduced demand for oil. So now we have this new set of circumstances uh, where we have less demand than usual for fossil oil or fossil fuel energy. Um, creating a lot of uncertainty within the African continent, not only for oil producers, 
but also uncertainty on how to stay on track with the, the transition journey. Here we're looking at um, not only are we or is it viable to keep pressing with regard to the development um, of, of um, exploitation of fossil fuels, where you have natural gas, where you have petroleum. You're also looking at the angle of what will be the consequence in terms of that transition, what we're saying the transition into clean energy. Um, because now a lot of processes are stalled. So the hope for at least the fossil fuel industry is that the demand is steadily going to increase. And as uh, Mr. Kasande um, pointed out, I just made a note, is with his presentations, you can see that there's a lot of reliance on African countries with regard to um, fossil fuel energy uh, because of the reasons that I said it before. It's available, it's... it's um, it's uh, you know relatively uh, cheap and easy, so there's a lot of that reliance, and there's really building capacity or there's incoming capacity that is still going through the the the, the scope of development in terms of really harnessing and making optimal use of renewable energies in Africa in many African countries. Uh, this is not to say, however, that they're not some very key you know trailblazers in Africa, but majority is a lot of development is still going on. Um, the question, I think, is um, in terms of arguments for and against this idea or, or progression of fossil fuels is twofold. Uh, claims of projection that the coronavirus pandemic will wipe out all the demand for fossil fuels due to a collapse in demand, and therefore this um, argument developed further claims that the drop or collapse in demand of fossil fuels is in part, will in part create a center stage for the emergence of the shining of renewables. That's on the one hand, one, one argument regarding where fossil fuels are going to go post-corona. On the other hand, you have an argument that really supposes that despite these scenarios that we're seeing, uh, such uh, as recent oil drops and, and the like, one can't negate uh, more so particularly with regards to African states, the need for, and this is now where I think I should highlight, reliable sources of energy. And by reliable, we mean reliable production, reliable um, supply to the citizenry, to the industry. Um, that is, is, is going to be achieved. Um, and a lot of the, the consensus with regard to this argument is that that, el that element of reliability comes in with fossil fuel, is still heavily dependent on a lot of fossil fuel energy within the African continent. So again, both lines of reasoning have their uh, criticisms or um, critiques, if you'd like, um, which are all valid, but um, the, the idea is to look at this, this question pragmatically. What is practical? for a lot of African nations, taking into account issues of um, infrastructure, the skill and expertise level and development, institutional capacity, policy and regulation, for instance, and which is a major one in terms of, of transition between fossil fuels to renewables is policy and regulation, as well as opportunity and set developmental goals. I thought it would be interesting to put in um, the, one of the goals that a lot of countries are seeking to achieve and I think have incorporated into their vision uh, 2030s as um, you know, outlined by Prof. Damilola is the sustainable development goal number seven on affordable and clean energy. And we can see one of the targets is that by 2030, note this is 2020, and um, this is 2020 in the midst of a global pandemic. So again, you look at how realistic are some of these targets to be met. One, for instance, to um, sustainably increase the share of renewable energy in the global energy mix, which is now to increase the or to bring in the importance and, and um, feasibility of renewable energy in the energy mix. And then um, another one is to expand infrastructure, upgrade technology for supply of modern sustainable energy services in developing countries. Now, um, despite all the many factors that may have, may be leading already to a progressive realization of a lot of these goals in African countries, the most of recently because being delays due to coronavirus restrictions and directives, 
you also have seen, it's not all doom and gloom, you've seen African countries that have um, really um, put out um, dedicated and vigorous efforts to try and achieve these things. You have, for instance, just because this is my country, um, the, the Kenyan government really pushing the country to towards increased reliance on green energy in an effort not just to mitigate climate change or climate change factors, but also to diversify energy sources. Another one that is not African, but is also um, uh, a place that we can use, you know, kind of like uh, lessons learned is Copenhagen in Denmark with the push to uh, a carbon neutral economy. What are some of the steps that are, are, are they implementing? Or are they looking to implement? And then how practical is that when you bring it within the context of a lot of African um, nations? So for me, um, just as I'm about to finish, is to rearrange the question if I could, is not really whether African governments are prepared uh, for post-COVID fossil fuel future, uh, because at least you've seen the different and vigorous efforts to get to a clean energy, but rather the question is in the context, uh, in this specific context, would, um, what are the decisions and what are the considerations made by African governments? And I think that we'll have very good discourse in this, in this panel in the previous one when we go, go to investment. Um, what are the decisions and the considerations of African governments and how are these decisions going to be made and how will that look for the future? The decisions that are being made now, despite the consideration of we need to uh, boost the economy, we need to uh, really inject a lot of life back into uh, a stalled economy, what will those decisions look like in the future? And really, what does the future look like in terms of energy and energy provision? So lastly, um, I think I'll, I'll go a lot into my, my presentation at the very end, but I, I, I like to put this close with the, the saying, I guess, uh, necessity is a mother of invention. So what can we say is our energy needs within the African continent, especially looking um, towards a post-corona future, uh, God willing, and how can we best achieve these needs um, in an effective, sustainable, and I highlight, underlined, and bold in red, reliable manner, um, alive to the reality that the decisions we make today will definitely affect the trajectory of um, the energy transition journey tomorrow. I think I will stop there and wait for questions at the end of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Miss Kate, and thank you for leaving us with that food of thought. Food for thought. We also hope that the many experts that we have on this on board will be able to answer some of those questions or at least point to us where we're heading to post COVID nineteen, God willing, as you said.